Thank you very much, uh, Achiro. Uh, over a decade ago, Achiro came to Paris to work for the Development Assistance Committee on the digital divide. And he made a fantastic contribution there. He hired a young research assistant who is today one of the world's experts on the governance of the internet. And in fact, she's gone to join ICANN at the moment and is working through all these very difficult issues right now on the governance of the internet. And uh, Ichiro, it seems as though China wants to make the digital economy one of the big themes for the G20 next year. So we may need you again in Paris. Uh, now, I want to thank uh, Fintap and Tony Edison for uh, inviting me to write a paper on China's aid, because I think we can't discuss this whole issue of development cooperation, development finance today without discussing what China's doing. And I was, you know, often have to say, look, China is the elephant in the room or not in the room. Actually, it is. Justin Lin is with us here today, and uh, he is uh, uh, tremendously engaged in this whole question because I want to argue that China is having a huge impact on the way in which we see the development process, on the way we see development uh, financing. And I want to, uh, I've written this paper, you can get the paper, but I'm not going to track through the paper uh, today. I want to connect the issues up with some of the intellectual and uh, economic history issues that we've been reviewing over the last uh, few days. I want, first of all, to talk about creative destruction in the development finance industry today. And then I want to look at uh, what the China story is telling us about the role of public entrepreneurship in trade and development. I want to look at the financial engineering behind China's super fast growth, and then how this, these two things are making China a kind of global entrepreneur uh, today. And then finally look at uh, China and the S uh, SDGs. So, creative destruction in the development finance industry. China has two parallel uh, development uh, financing systems. The first is the traditional aid program been going since the 1950s, uh, is funded out of the national budget. Uh, that budget officially is at three billion. We know it's probably quite a lot more than that because uh, some departments, some ministries aren't uh, joining in the, um, in the uh, system of reporting numbers and so forth. And then we have another system, which is basically the finance being generated for developing countries by China's policy banks, the Export-Import Bank and the China Development Bank. These are funded by bond issues on the Chinese uh, financial markets with sovereign guarantees. These policy banks have sovereign guarantees. And these, uh, <clears throat> these Funding flows are making China the largest single source of development finance in the world. Now, I can't give you the numbers. Nobody can give you the numbers. But when we <coughs> check on balance sheets and so forth, uh, that uh, is emerging as the case. And we don't know the numbers why, because they are generating commercial operations. And commercial operations are not reportable, uh, neither by that countries nor anybody else in reporting uh, uh, systems. So that's why there's a statistical void. Now, let's look a little bit deeper here, what's going on. Uh, what's the difference between um, the DAC concept of uh, aid and Chinese uh, concept or South-South concept? The DAC concept is a of, of, of a welfare transfer, the 0 0.7 idea that you transfer resources and you get no commercial or financial return from that. And the rules are it's very strict, you know, you're, you're, kind of prevented from doing that. Uh, and the mutual benefit philosophy of South-South uh, and of Chinese aid, that is, we're engaged because when all this was worked out, we were all poor countries. We weren't transferring finance between each other. We were doing something else. And uh, so the mutual benefit philosophy is fundamental in uh, China. Now, there's another um, contrast that is very important right now, that is, the difference between fiscal transfers that comes out of a budget and financial engineering. That is financial engineering where you get money out of financial markets and you turn it into the development finance, whether you're raising bonds um, on the bond market or whether you are getting market-based official finance. 
market-based official finance is coming from the multilateral development banks and it's coming from these Chinese policy banks because they have a sovereign guarantee from the Chinese uh, government and they can lend, uh, they're lending at a rate that is more or less uh, like uh, the World Bank rate uh, is. Now, what have been the impacts of this? Well, we've had a reform of the ODA definition to tighten it up so that it excludes any financial engineering and only focuses on financial transfers. Richard Manning has played a very big role in getting this reform in and making sure that the aid money is focused on poorer countries in grant form. But we've also seen the revitalization of development banks because the example of the Chinese policy banks has reinvigorated the um, the idea of development banks. It's a very strong element in the Addis Ababa uh, action uh, agenda. And uh, in the multilateral development banks, the rising level of ambition has, to a large extent, I think, come from the example of China. They've written this report on from billions to trillions. And in the uh, Addis Ababa agenda, they are asked to review the scale operation of their operations, uh, etc. And in debt sustainability frameworks, moving from a loan by loan uh, process of looking at low income country uh, debt accumulation to looking at borrowing aggregates and looking at it over a 20 year time horizon, etc. So these are quite big impacts. And China has brought the whole idea of transformation into the debate. And in the high level uh, group on uh, uh, infrastructure of the G20, they argued for the concept of transformative infrastructure that would change the debt capacity of countries in a way that meant that uh, the, the, the lending um, growth process would be dynamic and sustainable. Now, uh, next uh, point here is uh, what are we learning from the China transformation uh, argument? And um, my co-author, Zhao Junzhu, whom I should have mentioned earlier, um, who has made a big study of uh, the whole IDA replenishment process in the uh, World Bank and will publish a book about that next year, along with a book by Justin Lin that's coming out next year also called Beyond Aid, which is uh, the subject really of what we're talking about here. Now, what is public entrepreneurship? Public entrepreneurship is the public action needed to create and to sustain a dynamic market economy. And the public entrepreneur brings vision, action, and innovation. And we've seen that in the emerging countries. That's what the successful emerging countries have shown us. And some people call it the developmental state. Some call it the learning society. Justin calls it the facilitating state. But it's a proactive state. And our trade and development models have left us out. They've left us out and they've been seriously incomplete and wrong, and I think we heard that story the other day in the trade, um, trade sessions. Need soft and hard infrastructure plus human capital. Ron Finley says he thought of this many years ago, that Adams, it's in Adam Smith, if you read Adam Smith uh, properly, but we have seriously underestimated it. Um, and we left Africa without any of this investment for two decades. We opened the way for the predatory leaders and elites who set back the whole agenda, caused huge misery, who are still there in many countries. So um, that's, I think, one of the key things we've learned from uh, uh, China and the other, other uh, emerging markets. Now, what about how did China finance its super fast uh, growth? Well, in the 1980s, the whole thing started with a land reform in one village, one small village. Uh, uh, which allowed peasants to make some money for themselves. That produced a huge production response. And Li Keqiang said earlier this year, you know, uh, cent the centuries old problem of hunger in China was solved in two years. And then there were rural economy incentives. So the rural economy grew. The on-farm investment was basically family labor. And then at another level, because to begin with, China didn't have any resources. There were ODA loans from Japan, other donors, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and China was a tremendously fast learner. It learned a lot, absorbed a lot from all these donors. This was a real example of aid effectiveness. Now, in the 1990s, 
The policy banks were established. 1994, China Development Bank, Agricultural Development, Exim Bank. Sovereign guarantees and financial leverage in a repressed uh, financial system. There were not uh, big uh, financial markets uh, created. Now, the China Development Bank story is extremely interesting because it has financed the Lewis process in China. That is, the movement of people from a rural economy, uh, traditional low productivity, into a, a fast-growing, job-creating, uh, modern sector of the, of the economy. So how did it do this? Well, um, it had a mandate to do this. It had a mandate to do this, but the actual mechanism that it uh, found to do this, the local government financing vehicles, was found by accident. But then, like the agricultural reform, it was multiplied. So there are thousands of these local government financing uh, vehicles around uh, China based on land acquisition, requisition and sale. That's a very big subject, of course, but it was, I think, a, a, a very uh, key, key element in the whole thing. Justin Lin will afterwards refine and correct and so forth, but basically this is what uh, was going on. Then we had also foreign direct investment plus export orientation plus urbanization, creating this learning by doing economy and dynamic ca capacity development. So we were getting the agglomeration effects, the, the learning economy emerging. So um, what does this mean? Uh, it means that uh, China is coming forward now as a kind of global entrepreneur, uh, I would say. Now, how do we understand China today? People say China is state capitalism, and I think this is really a very misleading way of looking at how Chinese economy works, because it is, today, it's a private sector-driven entrepreneurial society, and it's not just me who says this, it's The Economist last week, read their Business in China review, and they have discovered that after all, China is not state capitalism. It's this other very entrepreneurial economy with new business models that are beginning to have global impact. So, it, and it has an innovation based uh, development strategy brought in uh, this year. And then China is emerging as a new architect in the international system. Let's have a look at what it's, it's coming up with. Four new development banks four new development banks. The, Afro, the Asian <coughs> Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank, which will be hosted in Shanghai, the Shanghai Organization Bank, Cooperation Organization Bank, uh, and India and Pakistan will be part of that uh, now, and the Silk Roads Fund. Three new regional initiatives. Uh, one, about linking China and Africa in the modernization process in the decades ahead. Uh, a new Silk Roads uh, initiative, the Belt and Maritime Road initiative. Uh, and in Latin America, they have a new uh, relationship with, uh, with CELAC. And they are creating two new forums. One will be called an International Knowledge Center for Global Development, and the other a Silk Road Think Tanks Network. So these will be discussion forum, and people will come to Beijing and, and uh, discuss uh, global development issues from that perspective. Uh, so China's in the business of creating new economic landscapes. It's thinking in very large terms of economic geography, and it's thinking of working with others. So these are very fundamental developments. Has, of course, very important geopolitical dimensions, as we've seen in the question of who would belong to the AIIB. It has very big implications for the governance of development cooperation, as Richard Manning said. Uh, the, is, there is the risk, this public entrepreneurship uh, posture brings risks of uh, competition, of uh, over-indebtedness, uh, etc. And um, uh, Zhao Zoom, my uh, co-author and I have, have written a book on this, governing, governing Development Finance in the 21st Century, Harnessing the Role of Public Entrepreneurship. And that's uh, in the Journal of International Development, published in in August. So those are very, very serious issues. There are risks that have to be um, uh, somehow uh, coped with. Now, just finally, China and the SDGs. China is going to support the SDGs. When it started out in the SDG process, very cautious. But now China is 
now on a quest for a green economy. It's generating these green industrial capacities and solutions. Why? Because it has huge problems. And so if you ha it's when you have a problem that you generate a solution. And that's what Albert uh, Hirschman was telling us a long time ago. Uh, then it has uh, capacities in the mobile internet industry, Huawei and other companies like that, working in Africa, working in Asia, uh, providing the backbone infrastructure. Uh, China itself is coming up with new internet models for pro uh, providing all kinds of services on the internet, including uh, finance, um, uh, um, payment systems, etc. Now, of course, Africa is not a laggard in the mobile internet system. This is a leading industry in Africa, so there are lots of opportunities there for interaction. Finally, um, the capacities of China in the urbanization and industrialization field, exporting the Lewis model. And that's where Justin is coming in with his new structural economics. Can now China help the industrialization process in Africa as wage rates in China rise, jobs move elsewhere, and the foreign investors from China are bringing with them the markets. They have the markets already. They're just shifting the production platform. So this is a, a huge, huge uh, new factor on the global scene. And um, <clears throat> finally, uh, what China could bring is development cooperation, transparency, and reform. And there's a lot of discussion in China about how to do that. What are the reform options? How to be uh, more uh, transparent? And uh, Chinese researchers are writing and proposing actively in these uh, areas, including from the China International Development Research Network, uh, in which uh, I'm involved. So finally, I just want to make a plug for a paper that's coming out next week uh, as an, an IDS working paper on towards a global reporting system for the SDGs based around a concept, uh, transformation potential and impact. That is, what is, it, what, what is your intended transformation uh, impact? And uh, then how do, you, how do you structure your programming evaluation uh, uh, around that? And it's a bit akin to what's happening in the climate change framework negotiations, bringing in this idea of intended nationally determined contributions, which were people will design, lay out, they'll be reviewed uh, as, they, as they go along. And uh, so the reporting system that we uh, propose would build in incentives for transformational thinking and program design to create systemic capacities, do real-time evaluation, to work with others and across the uh, silos. Thank you. <laughs>